In the book of Amos, chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible admonished us, give us this counsel. As there was apostasy in the land of Israel, at the end of that verse, the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. I wonder which Israel that God was talking to. Was it the Israel that was in apostasy or was it the remnant of the seed of Israel who tried to remain faithful to God regardless of what was happening in the land? Notice carefully with me on the screen what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. This is from volume 2 of the Selected Messages, 150, paragraph 5. As a people who believe in Christ soon appearing, we have a work to do, a message to bear. And what's that message? And what's that work? Prepare to meet thy God, as Amos 4.12 tells us. We are to do what? Lift up the standard and bear the third angel's message, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. We have to lift up the standard and bear what kind of message for these last days. That is the third angel's message. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Let's read about the third angel's message. And we are going to see what kind of message that is as we looked at that message before. Revelation chapter 14, third angel's message begins in verse 9. And the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So verses 9 through 11 is a warning from not only worshiping the image of the beast, but also from receiving the mark of the beast. Now, we may ask ourselves, who is the beast? Well, the beast is the same power that is described in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. The first beast that came up out of water, populated area, which is none other than the papacy. That is the same beast that we find in Revelation chapter 17, as a harlot, it is described there, that controlled the state, and also the same power in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn that came up out of the divided Rome that ruled the world for 1,260 years. This is what it is known as the Dark Ages. It is that same power as in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that Paul describes as the men of sin. Same power also in Daniel chapter 8 that the Bible also described by peace he shall deceive many same power that we find in chapter 11 of the book of Daniel the king of the north the king of the north it is the same power also we find in Revelation chapter 18 that the Bible tells us to call a people out of and what message that separates a people from Babylon. It is none other than the third angel's message combined with the fourth angel's message of Revelation chapter 18. So the third angel's message also reveals the uh, righteousness or, or justification by faith in the Son of God, which is what verse 12 describes. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice another passage here on the screen describing the third angel's message. The third angel's message is the what? The gospel message for when? For these last days. And in no case, notice carefully, and in no case is it to be overshadowed by other interests and made to appear in unessential consideration when in our institutions anything is placed above the, what is it again? Third angel's message. The gospel is not there, the great leading power. Notice carefully how important that the third angel's message is. Nothing should distract us from preaching the third angel's message. We cannot preach the three angels' message or the third angel's message while we are in unity 
with Rome and the fallen churches. Because the Bible tells us in chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse 8, second angel's message, says Babylon is fallen and is fallen. Fourth angel's message, Revelation 18, verse 4, says, Come out of her, my people, because of her transgression, because Babylon will not repent. So the message is clear. The third angel's message is not a message of unity with the fallen churches and especially with Rome, with the papacy, it is a message of separation. Our job, our, do, our duty as Seventh-day Adventists, we were raised to expose the sins of Babylon, but also to point a people to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Notice the next quote here. It says, I then saw the, what message again? The third angel said, my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, notice, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to do what? To select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should do engross the whole mind, the whole attention. You notice how serious, how important this message is because it's a matter of life and death as we just read in verses 9 through 11 of chapter 14 of the Revelation. It is a matter of life and death. And also in Revelation 18, it describes that, that the plagues are about to come and fall upon Babylon. God wants his people to come out of Babylon. So there cannot be unity with Babylon. This is the reason why God had raised men like Martin Luther, Wycliffe, Calvin, and John Huss, and many others to proclaim, to expose the teachings of the papacy and to share the light of Jesus Christ with those who are in darkness, hence the dark ages, to open their eyes, to understand, to make them free in Christ Jesus. Free, because the Bible tells us it is the truth that would set us free. Sanctify them through thy truth, John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. We want the truth. We want it as it is found in Jesus Christ. Notice carefully with me what this article says here. This is from the Lutheran World Federation. This was back in 2016. This was October 31st, as they were celebrating the anniversary of the Reformation. Remember, we covered this before. The Pope went there to celebrate, then was the 499th anniversary of the Reformation leading up to the 2017 500 anniversary. This was the step they were taking to the eventual killing or annihilation of Protestantism when the Lutheran Church came together to sign this and to claim that we were one now with Roman Catholic. Now keep in mind, this was not just uh, an agreement or signing agreement between the Lutheran Church and, and the Pope. This was the whole Protestant churches with the papacy that came together to sign this joint agreement. Let's go back to the article. It says, Pope Francis told worshipers that in the context of the commemoration of the Reformation of 1517, that is when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg, notice, we have a new opportunity to accept a common path. What kind of path? Common path. One that has taken shape over the past 50 years in the ecumenical dialogue between the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church. In his sermon, John G. emphasized, that is the one of the leaders of the Lutheran Church there, that both Lutherans and Catholics have much more that unites us than that which separates us. We are branches of the same vine. We are one in baptism. This is why we are here at this joint commemoration to rediscover who we are in Christ. Keep those words in mind. They said we are one in baptism. We are branches of the same vine. Branches of the same vine. That means in Christ. Now, this is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Keep that in mind. This is why we are gathering here. Now, keep the we 
that are gathering here. So anyone that were invited, that were actually there, present at this ecumenical gathering, agreed, have signed that we are one in the same vine, that we also one in baptism. Now keep in mind, the papacy does not baptize the way the Bible says to be baptized. So I don't understand this one in baptism. Notice, article goes on to say, healing, what are the words? Healing of wounds. The document states the prayer of Catholics and Lutherans for the healing of wounds and memories that cloud our view of one another. Adding, we recognize, notice again, emphasis on the word we, we recognize that we are freed by grace to move towards the communion to which God continually calls us. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 13 with me. Revelation chapter 13. Where have we seen or read a similar language there? Healing the wound. Notice in Revelation chapter 13, again this chapter deals with the first and the second beast, but we are dealing with the first beast, which we find in verses 1 through 10. The Bible tells us in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. What's the word there? Wounded to death. And is what happened next. Deadly wound was healed. And what follows? And all the world wandered after the beast. Now this is referring to 1798, when that power, the Roman Catholic Church, received a deadly wound. But then the Bible tells us that the deadly wound will be healed and how do we know this? When all the world are wandering and following after the beast. When we see all the religions are coming together. When we see that the so-called protest is over, that we are one as they quoted there. Now keep in mind, again, they said we, were, we are one. Here are some pictures there of this gathering back in 2016. You notice in the middle there, Pope Francis and the Lutheran leaders are dressed alike, which means, again, we are one. One of the picture, a close-up picture shows the Lutheran leaders with a Pope Francis dressed the same way. Now, keep in mind the headline was God's gift of unity. They said, this is based on, again, John chapter 17. Let's go to the book of John chapter 17. They said this is the will of God for His followers to be one, based on John chapter 17. Now keep in mind, in this prayer here, Jesus was praying for the disciples. Keep in mind what Jesus says in verse 11. He says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. Speaking of the disciples. Speaking of the, the few, he was not re referring to or he did not include the Pharisees there or any other religion. Verse 11 again, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Notice carefully. Verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Those that God the Father has given to Christ. Christ prayed that God will sanctify them through thy truth. That means this unity can only be based on what God says. Notice. Then it goes on to say, Verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified. How? Through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me, through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This is the passage, verse 21, that they are using to justify this unity. But again, Christ was not referring to 
was not praying for those who did not believe in him. Christ was not praying for those who had rejected him. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Again, if we are part of this ecumenical movement, can we honestly say that we are a movement that God has raised to preach the three angels' messages, as we have heard so often from Elder Wilson? But who else was there at that gathering as we looked at the pictures of these uh, leaders, the Catholic leaders and the Lutheran leaders coming together? Who else were there? Notice carefully. Here, you could see the arrow pointed to none other than Diop Ganune or Ganun Diop. Here's another picture there. You could see there is Ganun Diop at that gathering, at that event. And as you could see, the Pope is coming in and all these leaders, about 500 of them and plus, who were invited to commemorate the uh, death of Protestantism. And who joined them at this gathering? Ganun Diop. Notice, this was a picture that was taken back in 2016 when Ganun Diop went to the Vatican and met with the Pope. This was an, an ecumenical gathering. Another picture there. Now you tell me, do you see Ganun Diop passing out any great controversy to the Pope there? How did he get out from that place alive? Here's a video of Ganun Diop with the Pope. These men went there to meet with the Pope to commemorate the death of Protestantism. As a matter of fact, we covered this about two years ago, 2017, when we had uh, many Adventist leaders prior to the 500th anniversary of the Reformation that joined with the Roman Catholic, with the Lutherans, and with apostate Protestantism, and they signed an agreement that they are one. Notice, this was called a reforming, what's the word? Catholic confession. A reforming, pause. A reforming. Now, this is a reversal of what Luther did. This is a reversal of what Calvin did. This is a reversal of what John Huss did. In other words, these men or those men who have sacrificed their lives and some of them were burned at the stake, the, those men were troublemakers. They were the ones who, who caused this division from the Roman Catholic Church. Notice carefully, who else were, was there signing this agreement, this joint agreement, what they call a reforming Catholic confession? Who else was there? As you could see here, it says total signature count 1457. And among others, notice carefully, all of these green arrows are pointing to Seventh-day Adventist representative. As you could see, Donna L. Russell, Christopher Peter, and you have Nichols Miller, James, then you have Sergio A. And notice carefully more of representative from the Seventh day Adventist Church that came together to sign this agreement. Again, more on the screen here, one more here to say that now we are one with the Roman Catholic Church. Meanwhile, we were told that the protests that Luther started did not end with him. It is to be continued to the end of time, till Christ comes again. But now we are saying we have sent representative there to represent Seventh-day Adventists to commemorate, to sign agreement that the protest is over. Notice carefully, as a result of that, now you have the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church, they now can worship at each other's churches. Just like we have been seeing, the same thing has been happening within Seventh-day Adventist Church. We, you have Roman Catholic priests being invited there, even Jesuit priests being invited there. You have Seventh-day Adventist pastors going to ecumenical gathering and partake of the Eucharist. Notice carefully what this article says. From the Vatican News, Sweden's Lund Cathedral to host First Catholic Mass since what? Reformation. 
The decision by the Lutheran Church of Sweden to offer a temporary place of worship to a local Catholic parish reflects the spirit of Pope Francis' visit notice, to the city in 2016 for a joint ecumenical commemoration of the Protestant Reformation. The medieval cathedral in the southern Swedish city of Lund will be the setting for a Catholic celebration of the, of the what? Eucharist for the first time since the days of the Reformation. It goes on to say, Pope Francis and the Lutheran leaders spoke of their common journey of reconciliation. They also sign, notice carefully, a joint statement recommitting Catholics and Lutherans to witness more what? More closely together to remove the remaining obstacles that stand in the way of full Christian unity. Now, when you have nobody protesting, when you have no leading churches no longer protesting, then that means they have removed the remaining obstacles. When you have, when you don't have Seventh-day Adventists protesting, but maybe I should put it this way, when you have Seventh-day Adventists representative being there at that ecumenical gathering and singing him as we just saw the Ganune there of Ganune, singing hymn, Roman Catholic hymn. That means the Pope now can do whatever he wants to do. The whole world is really indeed following after the papacy. Now, let's look at who else was there at this gathering event. There it is right there. Joint Catholic Lutheran commemoration. The green arrow is pointing to D of Ganune and the other green arrow is pointing to Seventh-day Adventist Church. When you look at the purple arrow, this is Bishop Brian Farrell. He is the secretary of the Pontifical Council for the promotion of Christian unity. And we discussed, we talked about this Jesuit priest before, who is a very good friend of D of Ganune. Wherever he goes, you will find Diop Ganune there because he is Diop Ganune's mentor. Notice what he, he says. Search for Christian unity is making progress, Vatican official says. Who is that? Notice. Despite some new tensions, practically, the whole of Christianity is in a process of advancing beyond the controversies and competition of the past toward greater understanding, trust, and solidarity said who? Bishop Brian Farrell, Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. So according to this bishop, this Jesuit priest there, Farrell, he said that the controversy, there's no more controversy, there's no more protests. Now, keep in mind, Seventh-day Adventist was given a message to be a light in this dark world and to continue the protests that Luther started to show to the, the world the deception of the men of sin. Now, this priest is the same priest as I mentioned, and as we covered before, it is the same priest that is the mentor of the Ganune. If Seventh-day Adventist is no longer protesting, then that means the Pope now can again do as it pleases. Notice carefully. This is Farrell in the center there, red arrow, and then to his left, our right, is who else is there? Dio of Ganune. There they are again. To the right of Dio of Ganune, you find that same priest. One more picture, purple arrow, Bishop Brown Farrell, green arrow is Ganun Diop. They are inseparable. Notice, another picture there at a different event. This was in Bogota, Colombia, April 25th through 27, 2018. Purple arrow is Bishop Brian Farrell, 
again day of Ganune. And there they are again, he's speaking there and day of Ganune is listening attentively and even behind them on the screen you could see the name Ganun Diop and Brian Farrell. And here in 2016, there they are, next to Pope Francis is Bishop Brian Farrell and to our far right is, who else? Ganun Diop. Notice carefully with me what this headline says. Lutherans and Catholics sign joint declaration 500 years after the what? The Reformation. Notice, we apologize. They have done what? Apologize for our failures, the ways in which Christians have hurt the Lord's body and have offended each other doing when? Doing the 500 years since the beginning of the Reformation until today. Do you understand this? Based on what we just looked at here. They have apologized. Who? The so-called Protestants have signed this agreement to be one with the papacy and they have apologized to the papacy. And who again was there representing the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists? That was Diop Ganone. Go back to the screen. Thus says the Joint Declaration that the Lutheran World Federation and the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity have done what? Signed at the end on October 31st, 2017, the year of, what's the word? Coming, commemoration of the Reformation. Article goes on to say, notice, many members of our communities yearn to receive the what? The Eucharist at a table as a concrete expression of full unity. That's what happened when you lay aside your differences when you say we're no longer protesting against the teaching of the papacy, then you have to partake of the Eucharist. You remember the BEM that the Seventh-day Adventist Church signed in the 80s? BEM, Baptism, Eucharist, Ministry. When now they agree to be one with Roman Catholic and partake of the Eucharist. I am 100% sure that at that gathering, the Ganune partake, he took his Eucharist, he took his communion. Notice, back to the screen. We feel the pain of those who share their entire life, but cannot share the redeeming presence of God at the table of the what? Eucharist. We recognize our joint pastoral responsibility to respond to the spiritual hunger and thirst of our people to be one in Christ. We long for what? This wound to be healed in the body of Christ. This is the what? The purpose of our ecumenical efforts. Come on. The language there is very plain and simple. They tell you when we come together like this and sign this joint agreement with Roman Catholic, it's because we want to heal that wound. So those of us who are continuing the protest, we are the troublemakers in those last days. Notice carefully what he goes on to say. On October 31st, keep that date in mind, 2017, the last day of the year of common ecumenical commemoration of the Reformation. We are very grateful for the spiritual and theological gifts received through the Reformation, a commemoration we share together and with our what? Ecumenical associates from around the world. From where? From around the world. We also apologize for our failures, the ways in which Christians have hurt the Lord's body and have offended each other during the 500 years since the beginning of the Reformation until today. Do you understand what that means? That means Martin Luther was a lunatic. It means Martin Luther was a troublemaker that because 500 years ago, according to this article, 500 years ago, it was Luther who nailed those 95 theses which sparked the Reformation, the protest against the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Now again, this says October 31st, 2017. This was two years ago, which was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. A year before that, 2016, Diop met with the Pope there and the others, and also that same year, met in ecumenical movement. Remember also 
Who else on that very day, October 31st, 2017, who else met with the fallen churches in ecumenical gathering? I'm not talking about Ganun Diab now. I'm talking about Ted Wilson. Where? Remember, in Russia, Moscow, he met with the fallen churches in ecumenical gathering as one. Just like we read a moment ago, that coming together as one is to heal the deadly wound. There it is. Notice carefully with me. Watch this. And friends, it is a privilege to be at this very special event. Уважаемые гости, друзья, для меня преимущество и честь быть на этом торжественном событии. On the very day, October 31, 500 years ago, when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church. On behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I would like to thank the President of this country and the government for religious liberty. От имени церкви адвентистов седьмого дня хочу выразить благодарность президенту России и правительству этой страны за сохранение религиозной свободы. It gives us the opportunity of holding this event today. Это дает нам возможность и это событие проводить сегодня. It is a great privilege in this age, 500 years after the Reformation began. Великое преимущество, считаю, в этом веке отмечать пятисотлетие реформации. When there seems to be so much instability and challenges in the world. Когда повсюду, практически на всех континентах, так много вызовов перед человечеством стоит. To continue the reformation in our own hearts. In other words, as we saw Ted Wilson together with the fallen churches, this is a form, this is a way of apologizing. This is a, a form of unity, a way of uniting with the Pope and to say that the protest is over. Brothers and sisters, notice carefully with me. A company can go by a certain name and they sell certain products. But if the CEO or the owner of that company decides to sell the company, with everything in it and someone comes along and buys that company they may continue to function with the same products even under the same name as the previous owner but yet it still doesn't mean that the company is under the same leadership it's not under the same name they will change their logo because they don't want to carry the same logo that the previous owner carried. They will change their logo, but they may have the same name, same products, but it is not, it does not belong to the same owner. This is what has happened to Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been hijacked, again, by a ministry called General Conference. It's, it is called General Conference. That ministry does not belong, it's not a Seventh-day Adventist ministry. Diop Ganuni does not work for the Seventh-day Adventist church. Diop Ganuni works for the papacy itself. As once again, we looked at this video of Diop Ganuni singing hymns to the papacy. Let's go to the book of Joel, chapter 1. The book of Joel, chapter 1. Notice carefully what the Word of God says, beginning in verse 1. Joel, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. And let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. 
and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, what's the word there? Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and what else? And howl, all ye drinkers of wine. Why? Because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. What does that new wine represent here? Because of the new wine. What is that? Go to chapter 18 of the Revelation. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. Notice again, the fourth angel's message goes along with the third angel's message. Verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily, notice the word mightily, with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is what? Is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, every unclean and hateful bird. Notice carefully, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of the delicacies. So what's the new wine there as we read in the book of Joel? The new wine there is none other than the teaching of what? Of Babylon. Verse 6, back to Joel chapter 1. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he have the cheek teeth of a great lion. He have laid my vine waste and bark my fig tree. He have made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. This is exactly what the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists have done to the body of Jesus Christ. That's, this is exactly what they have done to the church. They are devouring the church. These men are working for the papacy. They are not working for God. They are not leading the church of God to Jesus Christ. They are leading them to the papacy. Notice carefully with me the council there. This tells us here from Great Controversy, page 45. After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. They saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dare not tolerate errors fatal to their own souls. Let's pause. The message here is this. I am calling the Seventh-day Adventist church. Hear me carefully here. I don't want anybody to miss this or to misunderstand this. I'm calling the Seventh-day Adventist Church out of the General Conference. Is that clear? I'm calling the Seventh-day Adventist Church out of the modern-day Phariseeism. I'm calling them out of those Jesuits that have hijacked the, the church. Notice carefully. If unity could be secured only by what? By the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be what? Difference and even war. Well, would it be for the church and the world if the principles, notice now, that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the heart of God's professed people? Notice, this is the reason why I am calling the church out of the general conference. We need to be revived. This is what happened. In the days of Christ, Christ came and called each of the disciples to follow him. He says, follow me. He calls them out of Phariseeism. Amen. He calls the church out of Phariseeism. The church needs to come out of this organization that have hijacked the Seventh-day Adventist church. Notice again, well would it be for the church and the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls, speaking of the reformers, were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. There is an alarming indifference in regard to the doctrines which are the pillars of the Christian faith. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, these are not of vital importance. This degeneracy is strengthening the hands of the agents of Satan so that false theories and fatal delusions 
which the faithful in ages past imperil their lives to resist and expose, are now regarded with favor by thousands who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Once again, my appeal, the call is this, for the church, for the Seventh-day Adventist church, for those who really love Jesus with all their hearts, minds, and souls to come out of the general conference. Coming out of the general conference does not mean you are no longer a Seventh-day Adventist. As a matter of fact, it shows that you are true Seventh-day Adventist. It shows that you are protesting because we were told that the third angel's message needs to be proclaimed throughout the whole world to expose the sins of Babylon. That's the reason why we were raised as a movement. Precious truth has been given unto us to expose the deceptions of Babylon. But if so-called the general conference is not teaching that, is not presenting that, and as they have been doing, conditioning the local pastors on what they can and cannot preach, just like the watchtower of Jehovah Witnesses controlled the sermons of the pastors, then therefore we can no longer remain and we can see the apostasy. We can see, as a matter of fact, this is no longer an apostasy because this is a different organization, as Sister White says. It's a different organization. It's a papist organization. Therefore, if we are true Seventh-day Adventists, we cannot continue to remain under the leadership of those Jesuits within the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. There's not one of them in there that we can trust. Because if there is at least one that we can trust, then they must speak out against what's happening. This is the reason why I have issues with men like Doug Batchelor, because when the Pope is gathering fallen churches in ecumenical movement, Doug Batchelor is present to talk about that. But he's not seeing, or he pretends not to see, that how Ted Wilson and Ganun Diop have sold Seventh-day Adventists to the Jesuits? No, they stay quiet and they don't want to talk about this. But again, as they are attacking me, as they are plotting against the watchmen on the wall, by God's grace, we will continue to blow the trumpet to call Seventh-day Adventists out from underneath the Jesuits of the General Conference and to be part of the 144,000 who follow the Lamb with the soever he takes them. God bless you.